Hey there internets, I'm Michael and this is Two Can Play That Game, bringing you a review of Horde by Cheeky Parrot Games. Now this is only a prototype of the game because it's currently seeking funding on Kickstarter, but we can still talk about it. So what is the game? Well, let's look at the cover here. We've got this dragon's eye up here and then the guy here who's on top of this pile of treasure. So not surprising, it's about people taking dragon's treasure out of its hoard. You are an adventurer trying to get the best and most treasure out of all the adventurers and it's a series of rounds and whoever has the most treasure at the end of a round gets victory points. The first person to reach five victory points wins the game. So let's take it to the table for a closer look. Setting up the game, you'll start by putting the three dragon cards out in the middle of the table, blue side up, the other side is red coloured in. You'll then set around that 12 cards. So this will just be all the cards shuffled up together and those randomly dealt out. And then you deal each player five cards to be their starting hand. Then, randomly determine who will be your first player. They'll then pick a card for them to start on. So for instance, this card here on the corner. They will then look at that card, not showing it to any of the other players, so that they have a bit of information about what is available on the table. The next player will then pick where they're gonna go and do the same, looking at the card, not showing it to any other players. That is then the game set up. To play the game, you'll play a series of rounds repeating the setup, and a round will end when either someone starts their turn with no cards in hand, that is start, not finish, and also the other conditions that can end the round are if you run out of cards in your draw pile, or if all three of the dragon cards here have been flipped over to the awakened side to reveal the fully awake, fire-breathing dragon. At the end of round, whoever has the most treasure points will get two victory points. Whoever has the second most will get one victory point. In a two-player game, you might just want to pay uh, best out of three. The game will end when one person has five victory points. Unless, as I say, you're playing a two-player game and you choose to just play best out of three. Before I talk about how the turns each work, I'm going to talk about all the different cards in the game. So there are five different types of treasure you are collecting in this game. You've got the black rings, the red chalices, the blue diamonds, green emeralds, and the yellow money bags. Also, it's important to note some of the cards, such as this green emerald card here, have picture of two emeralds on. That means it counts as two treasures. Other cards in the game, you will have treasure chests, and these count as wilds for the purpose of completing a set of treasure. So you, whenever you play one of these, you can choose what type of treasure it is, and it will score accordingly. Obviously, it still only counts as one treasure. However, there is another feature of playing a treasure chest, and that is these treasure chests are big, clunky, noisy things when you try and take them away out of this dragon's hoard. So what happens is it wakes the dragon, meaning you turn over one of the blue dragon cards. And of course, if all three get turned over, that's the end of the round immediately. How do you stop the dragon just waking up? Well, you can play these shh cards to try and put it back to sleep as you uh, try and soothe the dragon. So if you play one of these, you will then change a red card back to being a blue card. So obviously that will slow the game down a bit. Firstly, there are also these bones or eek cards where you've stumbled across some bones in the horde and screamed and that wakes the dragon up. So we flip the card to its awake side. And the final type of dragon card that will affect the dragon here is this dual one. So whenever you play one of these, you choose whether you use it for the shh side or for the bone side. So let's say we're shh 
in the dragon. So let's put it back to sleep. The final two types of cards in the game are the swords and the shields. Now on their own, these do not count as anything with regards to points. However, if you play a sword as your action, you may look at your opponent's hand and either take a card or give a card or both. So you could take a really good card and give them a bad card, or you could just take the really good card and give them nothing, or you could just give them a really bad card if you didn't want to take anything that they have. However, if that player has a shield card, they can instead play the shield and you do not get to see their hand or give or take any cards. Additionally, by playing the shield, they claim the sword and that will count as one point's worth of treasure at the end of the round. Additionally, if there are loose swords on the table where someone has played it on a previous turn and it was not stopped by a shield, any player may on their turn play a shield to claim that sword, which will then move in front of them into their treasure area, scoring them one treasure point. So that's obviously covered some of the options on a turn. If you have a dragon card as your action for the turn, you can play one of these. Additionally, if during a round you've played free and exactly free of these dragon cards, they're worth five treasure points. Again, on your turn, you can play either a sword or a shield card as your action. So that's two of the actions, dragon's cards or sword and shield cards. So what else can you do? Well, if you have a set of treasure, you can play that. If in your hand you have three of one type of treasure, so in this case we've got three green emeralds, or if we had three cards with one emerald, we could play this down in front of us in our play area, securing it so it can't be taken by any other players, but revealing to those players what our potential score is. And this will then be giving us treasure points for the end of the round. It's important to be aware that any of these treasure cards left in your hand at the end of the round are gonna be minus points equal to the amount of treasure they are. Additionally, if you do have treasure in front of you, such as these, you can add additional treasure to that set in multiples of two or more. So on your turn, if you have two or more of that type of treasure, you can add to it. But you can't just add a single card of that treasure. Final option of action on your turn is to roll the dice. If it comes up with this random symbol, which is the sixth side, that means that you get to choose how many spaces you move. Between zero, meaning you stay where you are, and five. So I could go one, two, three, four, five if I wanted, or stay where I am, or anywhere in between. When you then have moved, you will look at that card where you have landed. Of course, I already knew what this was because I saw it during the setup. But if I didn't, I'd get to look at it and gain information. At which point I have a couple of options available to me. I can choose to take this card, or I can choose to take a blind card off the top of the deck instead. Either way, I'll be taking a card and adding it to my hand. However, if I take the card that was down on the board, we then have a hole in the board, but I can take a card out of my hand and put that down to get it out of my hand and also be keeping my hand at a certain size and being aware of what's there. However, if I didn't have anything in my hand that I wanted to put down there, I could instead draw the top card off the deck, look at it to see what it is, but not showing it to any other players, and then put it down underneath my pawn. So I now know what is there for future turns. If when you roll the dice, you roll a number instead, you can choose to move that many spaces. Whenever you're choosing to move, you can choose to move clockwise or counterclockwise. It doesn't matter. It is up to you, depending on where you want to go, because you might know, oh, well, I know what that is, but I don't know what that is. I know I don't want that, so I'll go here and see. This is an emerald. I'll take that emerald, or I won't take it. It's up to you. 
So that is how the turn works. So you'll keep playing until one of the end of round conditions is met, either the dragons all being awake or the deck being empty, or you reach the start of someone's turn and they have no cards in hand, at which point you will count up the treasures that are in front of each player. So say this player had three green treasures and this player had three of those they would have an equal score. However, let's imagine this player also had a sword and shield, which are worth one point, but this player had a set of three dragon cards. It's important to note that it has to be exactly three. If I had four dragon cards played, that would not get me the points. So this player currently has eight points and this player currently has four points. You would then take into account how many cards are in each player's hand. So let's say this player actually finished the round by having no cards in hand, but this player had two treasure cards left in hand. That would mean because there are two treasures on them, they would have minus two, putting their score at six compared to four. That would mean this player has the most treasure, so they would get two victory points and this player would get one for having the second most. Or in a two player situation like this, you can just choose to play best of three. So that's a brief overview of Horde. So, well, what do I think of it? I'm gonna start with the artwork because as far as I'm aware from the publisher, all the artwork is final. So I can talk about that. It's only component quality really that I can't talk about. And the best thing artwork with this game is this dragon, both awake and sleeping. It's very nice, a very stylized dragon, very much in theme of the box art, really. So that's all fine. And then, of course, you've got these special cards that have similar artwork on them. The treasure, again, is done in a similar way of this kind of almost watercolory kind of drawings. The cards are very clear, very obvious what they are, just a bit plain. Um, but it all works fine. There's nothing offensive about this artwork, definitely. So what else can I talk about? Well, I can't talk about components, so let's go straight on to the gameplay. What do I think of it? Well, I think this takes two of my least favourite mechanics, roll and move and a memory, and manages to make a really good game out of it. Now, the roll and move aspect isn't such a, oh, if I roll a high number, it's good. If I roll a low number, it's good, etc. It's just if you roll the number you happen to need, it's good. But you don't really know what you need. And the memory aspect, okay, it can help if you remember, because if you have a choice of where to move, you can go, oh, well, I remember that this piece of treasure was there or this special card that I want to get. So I will do my choice of movement to there. But otherwise, it doesn't make a big difference to the game. Even if you can't remember where anything is, even if you're rolling just not the numbers you necessarily need or want, there's so much randomness in the card draw that it counteracts those elements to a reasonable degree. But you still have a good amount of choices there. And that is why I like this game. Despite all the randomness of the card drawing and the dice rolling, you still have those choices. Each turn you choose whether you're going to roll that dice, whether you're going to play cards out of your hand. Okay, if you haven't got anything in your hand to play, then you don't have a choice there. You've got to roll the dice. But then even once you've rolled that dice, you then go to a spot and you've got choices again. You can take the card that's there. If you take that card, you then have a choice. You can put something out of your hand down or put something down from the deck. So no matter what you're doing, no matter what luck throws at you, you still have choices in this game. And that is what saves it from being too much luck. The luck to strategy ratio is really good and where the strategy really kicks in in this game isn't necessarily just about what you're doing no it's about how you control the speed of the round so if you control getting rid of your cards getting more building up cards draining down cards giving cards to other people when you're controlling whether to wake up the dragon or put it to sleep and how you're doing that and getting the cards in order to do that is all very interesting to me and it does give a great amount of choices. 
Now, this is a game that I have enjoyed playing and I do recommend you at least look at the Kickstarter. It's not an instant buy. I'm not a big fan of these kind of little card games, but it is one that I will potentially be backing depending on the price. So I'm not a big backer of Kickstarters generally, but as I say, I'm gonna look into this, I'm gonna see what the price is like and potentially I might even get it. So that's a good indication of my thoughts and feelings on this. So what else is there to say? Well, if this was just set collection because of collecting the treasure, the game wouldn't be as interesting. The fact that they've added in just a few special abilities with the dragon cards being able to control the timer of the round almost, and then the wilds making these, yes, they're very useful, very good, but they have a downside, they wake the dragon. But is that a downside? Because you could use this as a bones card to wake the dragon. So that actually is really useful. There is an aspect of, okay, this could be a downside for you. It could be a bonus. You could go, well, I play treasure down and that wakes the dragon and it ends the round. Very good, very useful. The sword and shield cards, I like that you have the swords. That gives them more interaction than simply watching what other people are doing. Although that is an important aspect of this game because you need to look and gauge how many points is that person going to have if I end the round now. Are they likely to end the round now? So there is still interaction there even without these, but these add just that little bit of interaction. There's not a huge amount because there's not that many of them. And the shields just mean that you're not guaranteed to succeed if you use a sword. So you kind of have to gauge, well, do I think they have a shield? Do I want to save it until a few shields have been played? Do I want to play it early? It gives much more consideration and options and depth to the game. And I think the balance of numbers of treasure, two special cards works really nicely. So they've done a good job with that. Now, the final thing to talk about, of course, is the scaling of this game. Can two play that game? Two can play that game. In fact, I've not noticed any difference playing with two people particularly compared to playing with four, three or four people. The main difference is the memory aspect. When you're playing with two people, the memory aspect becomes much more important and much more useful because you're able to build up more of a picture of what is there because less is happening between each of your turns and therefore less is being taken by other people, changed by other people. So it is easier to do that memory. Whereas at the higher numbers, you're less able to do that memory. But as I've said, most of the times we've played, no one can really remember what anything is anyway. And you're still able to really enjoy the game because the only time you need to know, oh, right, well, I want to be able to move to there, etc., is when you roll that dice. And only if the number comes up that you would then be able to go there or you have the choice to pick a number that goes there. So yeah, really good for two people and really good for three or four. Okay, I do hope that you've enjoyed this video, of course. If you have, please do check out the rest of the videos on the channel and subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends and family. And do also take a look at us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. And as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.